everybody to the i'm not even going to bother with the episode number now behind the geek show i am joined by richard tubb scott riley and pete matheson and uh we are the guys that uh tell you all about and love sharing about all the crazy mistakes that we have and have had in our journey of running and growing and building and selling msps and uh the last couple of weeks this show has turned into the the scott therapy show or the scott business therapy show where we've dived into hot challenges or the, the, the biggest challenges that Scott's going on in his MSP at the moment, because he is the only one of us three that currently still runs an MSP. The rest of us have packed up and shipped out and moved on. Um, and so we've been diving into some of the hot topics that, that Scott's been having in his MSP and just brainstorming our all um, through them all and sharing all our different ideas and thoughts around how to get through them. Uh, this week, the topic that came up is when should I hire a sales rep? And there is many and varied opinions about this across the MSP space. As with everything, there is no perfect answer and there's no correct answer. It always depends on your situation and your scenario and where you're at. Uh, but we thought we'd have a bit of an open discussion around all the different things that come to play when you're trying to make that decision as to whether I should hire a sales rep or account manager or BDM or inside sales rep or whatever it happens to be in your business as you want to grow it. And just personally, if I am... Um, one of the biggest things that I, or one of the things that I noticed that a lot of MSPs do is they get to the three, four, five person size and they go, all right, my next hire has to be the sales rep. And they go out and they hire the sales rep thinking that that's going to be the key to their successful, crazy, spontaneous growth. And um, as yet, I've seen that happen at probably 50 times. And I have yet to see someone succeed at taking that strategy. It always fails. Six months later, that sales rep has never brought in any leads, let alone clients. And, um, and it's always a struggle. So that's typically what I'm seeing in the marketplace. I don't know what, who wants to kick off with something from what they're seeing and observing and maybe what they've done out there in terms of the whole getting a sales, like a dedicated salesperson into the MSP. I can see Pete is chomping at the bit. He's chomping at the bit. I'll, I'll <laughs> throw something in there. Um, only because it's something that I come across so, so often uh, and, and lots of people have expectations. When you get a salesperson... It's not a sales and marketing person. Mm. Everyone seems to think that the salesperson is going to come in and generate a ton of leads all of a sudden and do the marketing bit for them too. Mm. Two completely different things. You've got your marketing arm or leg to your business that kind of generates, you know, does the brand awareness and does bring in leads. You've got the salesperson that then takes those leads and then does something with them. That's, that's definitely the first thing and biggest 100%. thing that I see. Yeah. 100% yeah. agree. Yeah, if I can, again, this is a soapbox topic for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I, and like you, Nigel, I have seen so many MSPs reach a stage where it's like, right, we're growing at a reasonable rate, but we want to sort of accelerate that. Uh, or the flip side of the coin is we've got no leads whatsoever. I know we'll hire a salesperson. And as Peter's just said, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. Marketing comes before sales. The two, you know, are intertwined. Uh, but what typically happens is the business owner uh, so if we're talking about nimble MSPs or MSPs say up to about sort of 1.3 million or there and thereabouts, the MSP owner will say, right, we need to accelerate sales. I'm going to bring a salesperson in. And what they're essentially doing is abdicating responsibility yeah. for sales. They're saying, right, I'm going to make this higher and you're going to wave your magic wand and mm -hmm. we're going to end up with a full pipeline, which is often a marketing issue, not a sales issue. And we're going to end up with a ton of new clients. Now, in my opinion, uh, and this is why it's a soapbox topic for me, the best salesperson in nimble MSPs is the business owner. So they can go out, have the conversation, speak with passion, speak with authority about the business. And most nimble MSPs that I come across, if sales and marketing are an issue, uh, it's the business owner that needs to go and look at sorting those things out before they can then go and get help hire people to come in and almost abdicate responsibility. So that's that's what I'll say about that. That's what I've seen at the nimble MSP space. Of course, we've got an audience today that's, you know, all shapes and sizes of MSPs. Of course, there comes a time when you need to hire salespeople. But I wanted to say that up front, you know, back you up, uh, Pete. Marketing is not sales. And the best salesperson within a, an MSP business is typically the business owner. I, I tend to find that the, the first role, well, not you know, not the first role, but the first kind of sales role um, that that we certainly looked to hire in our, in our days and what I saw over the years was more of an account manager role rather than an actual salesperson. So if you get someone in that can actually do the day to day stuff like existing customers, PC quotes, like refreshes, you know, even infrastructure upgrades, like they can sell that and quote that and do all that kind of stuff. 
that's kind of like the first salesman in a certain sense because they're they're doing the sales but to the internal stuff and sometimes in case when the new stuff comes through they can deal with that if it's like smaller stuff as well um so i I always first gatherer role right like that's the gatherer side of the sales role versus the hunter that's the one that's actually actively out there chasing new meat let's call it but new prospects out there exactly yeah and and something else that might be worth talking about today because yeah, I, I had an engineering background. I was a techie, and and this always frustrated me with working in like the larger MSPs because I, th- I think we'll get to it in a bit. But it gets to a certain size when yes, salespeople do make sense. You know, the smaller business doesn't doesn't really need that sales sales role. But I was an engineer in a company that did a lot of sales. I had loads of new business coming through, and all I really saw was the salespeople and the account managers and everyone else would get rewarded, and whereas me as the techie was stuck behind the scenes you know locked in server rooms doing the kind of doing delivering the stuff that's actually generating the income um to the stage where you know you'd have like your staff day out so be like, oh the engineers can't come oh they're too they're far too busy they, they can't come out it's like come on now like we're delivering the work we're actually making the money yes you've got you've, you know, you've gone out and sold it but we've actually delivered the work that's generated the money that now means you can pay for those staff days out and then they just never found the time to reward the engineers other than, you know, you right. do your, like, your go-karting evenings out and the kind of usual engineering, team building e type kind of events that you do. Um, but that's always a distinction I wanted to try and um, fix to a stage with, with my MSP. And obviously, we didn't get to that stage where we might have needed that dedicated person. But we, we were hiring account managers. We had those kind of roles within the business. And my opinion was that if they do well... The business does well and all the staff do well. So, you know, the salesperson, their job is to bring the sales in and sell it and, you know, convert the clients. But then the engineer's responsibility is to then deliver it and do a good job on the delivery side of things. Everyone plays a part. It doesn't matter if you're the team leader, the manager, the engineer, the first line, like they all have a role to play in that whole kind of customer service, like the customer delivery aspect of things. So yeah, I've never really been a fan of, um, and I guess that goes on to like the whole commission structure as well. Of, like Ooh, I've never been right. a fan of, rewarding people for selling something when well they didn't deliver it they didn't actually install it these guys are like pulling all nighters like training like skilling up on constantly new things all the time they're they're having to learn all the stuff trying to implement the sales guy oversold typically (laughs) well that's that's the other thing and my my dad was a salesman and uh yeah very much was uh go go out and um the the product can do this and then the engineers come out and go (laughs) definitely doesn't do that (laughs) And they got to pull the yeah, old so I've, I've always had that kind of maybe skewed opinion on um, like sales staff and rewarding sales staff. It's it's the company as a whole that needs to deliver, not just the sales staff. It's not you know the sales staff shouldn't be rolling rolling around in like I guess nowadays it's like Teslas and those kind of things versus the engineers who are in like I don't know Vauxhall Astra Estates or, or something. <laughs> it's, you know, it, the 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 wealth and not just from a financial point of view, but the wealth in, in general within the company should be you know spread equally in in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, fair call. Uh, I think so. Um, that's a bit of a rant. <laughs> there, there was, I think there's a lot of philosophical <laughs> good behind that in the greater world as well. I think um, sales is an important function, of course, and to, like salespeople do love that incentive in there. But I, I think you're 100 right. Like I look at the real estate industry, and I think that one's that's one that's wildly over. I don't know if it's the same over there, but over here in Australia, I think it's wildly over incentivized compared to what it should be over here. And um, and I think it's, it's that same similar philosophy behind the scenes. Um, Lee Wood made. Uh, a couple of points where he, he wrote, number one, owner sells, number two, sales admin, number three, account manager of existing customers. And that's exactly how we had our MSP as well when I sold it. Right. Um, we had me doing or me doing kind of most ish of the, the larger new sales. And we had our senior engineers slash account managers that were both kind of shared those roles um, doing all of the, even new client sales if they were up to a certain size. So if it was kind of a 20, 30 seat client, they would go and deal with that. It was something bigger than normally I'd come in and, and help out on that thing. And then we had the sales admin role in there supporting us all. They were the per- people putting together the quotes and doing all of the, the back end proposal stuff and everything so that we were able to go out and do our job nice and easy. And so that distinction yeah. of those three roles was, I, I, I see most MSPs can live with that three setup up until 10, 20, 30, maybe even 40 staff up there, um, depending on how you're going before you have to dive in and and start getting sales. And the reason the reason I see most people fail at sales, and, and you guys might have some ideas or thoughts or observations on this as well, is that the business is not ready for a sales rep. It's not like they don't have a good product to go and sell. And it's not like they Absolutely. don't they don't have things. It's that they don't have all of the paraphernalia and all of the 
all of the, the process that a good salesperson really needs underneath and around and to support them to go out and do their job well. And that includes yeah. all the proposal management, a whole structured and, and documented sales process, it includes all the sales power from an alia and, and objection handling stuff and training on all of this stuff. Um, and most most MSP owners that I see that go through that process and they fail, it's because they just hire a salesperson. And as you said, Richard, it's just abdicate responsibility. Like, I'm just going to throw you in a sales role and expect you to, to do all yeah. of those sales, including build the whole sales engine around you. And most sales reps are not good at that at all. Well, to, to, to Pete's point, actually, because we don't want to demonize sales here. You know, the oh. title of the show is when should we hire a, uh, a salesperson? Sales isn't bad. And I think anybody who's watching this who's a business owner knows that they're also a salesperson. So it's like we're talking about ourselves as MSP owners when we talk about sales. But to, to Pete's point earlier, when I ran my MSP business, we came across a lot of um, MSPs around us, competitors, who we started calling sales organizations because mm -hmm. they had a team of salespeople. They would go in, promise the earth, and then the client engineering wouldn't be able to, to deliver that. And they picked up reputations. Yeah. And sh sure, they grew really, really quickly. Oh, yeah. So yeah. for any of you watching this and like, yeah, but the local competitor, they're doing great sales and everything. Are they delivering it? Check Will out their churn. Will they still be around? Yeah. Will they still be around? Because I'm looking back now at, you know, uh, my former stomping grounds in Birmingham in the UK. And the majority of those MSPs who are sales machines, and I use that as a bad term when, you know, it's not necessarily a bad term. They're not around because they delivered, well, they didn't deliver services that they sold to Pete's point there. So for, for most MSPs who are watching today, and I'm looking at the attendee list and that, I absolutely agree with you, Nigel. You're much better off the, the business owner becoming more competent at sales. So like I went through Sandler sales training mm, myself yeah. uh, to overcome that tendency of being a geek and wanting to talk <laughs> about features and benefits and to actually zip in my mouth and listening really difficult for somebody like me and then putting in place the administration because how many people watching this today have got a proposal or a quote that needs finalizing and sending out to a client <laughs> i'm leaving an awkward pause there because 100 most of, them. of us most of us are going to be like yeah i need to go and do that so don't turn off don't go and rush away and do that. Listen to what we've got to say about this because, you know, putting in place the sales support is a really important part, oh, yeah. uh, part of growing as a business. Yeah. Scott, you worked in a larger MSP before you kicked off your own. What? How, how did they structure this? They had a dedicated sales team, I think, because you that was a large enough size where it, it warranted it and whatnot. How did you your team interacted with that sales team a lot? What Did you make some observations in there at that are going to be helpful to have the guys listening of guys and gals listening on to this um around for an msp of that particular size yeah absolutely so i mean we would have been about 100 million turnover when i joined right. the business so right. the sales team would have been a good 30 to 35 people oh, wow. at yeah, that right. stage okay um so it was quite an established sales team but they knew how to sell wide area networks and voice services pretty right. much um, I joined the business to launch private cloud. So our own cloud platform, managed IT services, all those kind of things. Um, and so, you know, it was really interesting because what I learned there is things that I can apply right now as, you know, as a new MSP, which is, you know, I'm coming in with a brand new set of products and services and skills and capabilities, and price points and margins. And we had to go through the whole thing that we're talking about now. We had to get all the documentation ready. We had to get all the proposal material. We had mm. to get all the data sheets. We had to train the sales guys. Yeah. We had to help them you know, with objection handling, what questions to ask of their clients. What are the price points? And more importantly, what's the margin that we as a business are more likely to make on this deal? And then how much of that is gonna turn into commission if this sales guys actually do it? And so we had to go through this whole process. And you know, as I joined that, there was me and two other guys kind of launching private cloud into this organization. So most of that sales process and, you know, meeting the customers fell on me. The sales guys were literally kind of door openers right. to meet their clients because we luckily we had two teams, right? We had the account management team looking after this established base of uh, this hundred million pound turnover. Um, and then we had the hunters who were going out and trying to find new business. And it was trying to work with both of those teams to help them see if we sell the cloud stuff, we can make good margin, you can get good commission, and everybody wins. Now, the teams generally split really easily, or the, or the personality split really easily. You had those people who just went, nah, 
I know how to sell what I know how to sell and I know how I get paid for it. And I'm not learning anything new. And you're like, okay. And then you had the guys who kind of went, yeah, do you know what? This could be good for my customer. I can see some opportunity. Maybe we could sell some of this stuff. And those are the guys that you could put the effort in and work with. So, you know, as I look at people in MSPs now, if, if you've got a sales team that you're trying to get to sell a new product or a new service, there's so much legwork that you have to do in the background to get all the paperwork right, get the proposal material right, get the training right. Otherwise, what you get back is a wall of excuses. I can't sell it because I don't know how much yeah. it costs. I don't know how much yeah. we make on it. I don't know what my commission is. I don't have any data sheets. I haven't got any proposal material. So again, all of this applies. If you're thinking of hiring your first salesperson in an organization, do you have all these things in place today? Because as the player manager, it's all in here. Mm. And it's all in previous proposals that you've got in Word mm. on, your, yep. on your laptop, right? It's not in a system. It's not written down anywhere. The margins, you can sometimes. <laughs> um, discounts, uh, you know, the, oh, well, I like these guys. We'll give them a discount. There isn't enough structure to it for you to bring a salesperson into that process. So I learned a huge amount of that inside that, that larger organization. And you could... You could see the two types of categories of, of the guys. The, the hunters were just door openers. Right. Get it. Get the door open, get a meeting with the client, and then throw in a pre-sales person or a techie. Throw someone in who can have a real conversation with the client about what they need, whether the product's a good fit, and then come out the back of that. And this is to Pete's point, which is, you know, the, the, those door openers, that's all they did, was they got the door open, ushered in a pre-sales person, and then the pre-sales person qualified the opportunity, designed the solution or, or built out the components of the solution, priced it, proposed it, pitched it, went back, objection handled it, closed it essentially. And then they don't get a commission, but the sales guy gets a commission. And we were like, <laughs> oof. <that's... laughs> someone's doing a lot of the heavy lifting yeah. and someone's not, but someone's getting a lot of commission. Um, and, then, and you would get those typical kind of frustrations. Well, None of you would have a job if it wasn't for me in sales. <laughs> so That's I think there's, there's a lot here that we've got to get right around, you know, having the stuff in place first, having the structure and the commissions and the, and the pay scheme. So it, it incentivizes everyone. You know, yeah. to do the right things. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's why I, another reason why I've always been a big fan of the mantra that that good marketing nearly makes the sales process non necessary or very unnecessary Agreed. in there. And the more, the better you get at marketing in there, the better you're delivering sales qualified leads to an internal account manager role, rather than having to have a, a hunter out there doing the okay. hardcore closing out there. And so, so I'm even in my MSP in the tech tribe in in every business I'm involved in. We, I double, triple, quadruple down in marketing and nurturing and all of that sort of stuff just because I don't even want a heavy sales requirement inside that type of business. And in, in the B2B sales space, that can work very well. There's certain industries that, that absolutely require hardcore sales closes and all sorts of stuff in it. But in our B2B space, I, there's often not anywhere near as much of a need for it as what people think. And the, the account managers can typically take over just from the marketing qualified lead and close from there. As you were talking about then, Scott, you get... The, a good quality of, of leads coming through and a good lead flow coming through. And you don't need hunters out there doing it to, to be able to close them. If you can keep that lead flow up and you can keep your getting the right number of leads coming into the top of your funnel and getting them nurtured all the way through and then handing across to a, a well-trained account manager there that's going to do the, the the work for you rather than a high highly paid, hard to often hard to wrangle. I'm going to paint with a pretty broad brush here, but often hard to manage salesperson especially in a, like I find this in smaller MSPs is, um, and we went through this process a few times in some other businesses I, I was um, involved in owning where we would go out and we'd hire the salesperson when we're tiny and we'd go and hire them thinking that they were going to be that, that person that was going to solve everything and um, not realizing that we were hiring what we thought was a sales manager, but what we we're hiring was a sales rep. And there were two wildly different different things out there, and and yeah. we didn't realize that hiring a sales rep wasn't didn't come with all the sales manager stuff in the in there as well. Um, so yeah, ton of points in there, Richard. You said you wanted to make a point about yeah. the investment into sales systems versus um or ver in it was following on from what you said, Nigel. You know, if I was to start an MSP again today, and I'm not going to, by the way, if I was though, yeah. I would make it into a marketing machine yeah. that almost made the sale like the sales are to be lost yeah so you know we all know nowadays we've talked on the show about content marketing uh you know marcus sheridan stuff they ask 
uh, uh, we answer, that type of stuff. It should be a situation nowadays, and you know this as consumers, where you approach somebody and you know all the answers, and it's basically like, right, I've just got one or two little things to, to make a decision on you know where I spend my money with you. The sale is there for you to lose. So if I was to start an MSP again today, I would invest in marketing. I would make the sales just sort of trickle in all of the time. Then, though, and this is uh, to Scott's point about having the structure there, I would invest up front in a sales system, right. not just like a workflow, but there's tools out there at the moment. So, you know, I'll give a shout out for Zamentum, which is like a, a revenue generation platform. But there's also um, ConnectWise Sale or Quozal, as it used to be knows. Uh, known uh, there's quote works out there these are great but something like zamentum like the lead comes in and you can automate a lot of this it's like do a little bit of sanity checking put it into the sales system and it just spits out a form that says hey sign here e-signature let's get it into the system let's get you rolling with that the sales is not the most difficult part of that part point and a tool like zamentum um, helps you actually to do more upselling which is perhaps something else that we can talk about as well yeah. Um, one of the, so we're obviously, we all kind of agree. And I think most of the audience in here as well will agree that, that hiring a sales rep in a nimble MSP is one of the last roles you typically fulfill in there. Um, but let's, Dot, you mentioned it before, Richard, that you put yourself as the, the sales rep in your business through sure. Sandler sales training. And I think this might be an important topic to, to dive into a little bit is the, the whole sales training process and, and enabling ourselves, if we're the owner uh, in the business yeah. or our account managers to get more structured at our understanding of sales and, and have a framework to work with. And so Richard, you, you went through what a lot of people will know is, is called the Sandler training system. And you put yourself through Sandler that. Sandler sales training. Know. Yeah. Before we get to Sandler though, and I, you know, I, I want to rave about the Sandler stuff of a big <laughs> fan, but we're going to go back to a book that we recommend again and again and again. And Scott knows where I'm going to go with this one. And it is this book here. The Go Giver go by Bob Berg. Now I was only tweeting back and forth with uh, Mr. Berg this morning if you are watching this show and have heard us speak about this book, book before and you've not gone out and buy it, go and buy it. If you've not heard of this book before, go and buy it. It's like a really you know, short read. It'll take you an hour with a pot of tea. But it, all, it talks about some things that we as MSP owners, I think, do naturally. Most of us get into this industry because we want to help people. And we think of sales as this friction point where we've got to persuade other people to buy stuff that they don't necessarily want. That's the stereotype, the head trash that we've got around salespeople, isn't it? We think of used car salesmen and all of that jazz. The go-giver teaches you that if you listen and, and actually think about what the person needs and respond to that as opposed to reacting – you can just help people and sales becomes an absolute breeze from that point forward. So number one recommendation for the go-giver, but to your point, Nigel, you know, when I reached that, that stage where it was like, okay, I want to put a formalized system in for sales meetings and stuff. Sandler sales training is the route that I went down. Now it's a big investment. This is an advert for Sandler. We've got no uh, connection with Sandler whatsoever, but it's a big investment in time and it's a big investment in money. But it was one of the best things that I ever did as a business owner. And it still, to this day, helps me. And I'll be perfectly honest, it's just an extension mm. of the go-giver. Um, you know, it just talks about listening to people, responding and helping them, uh, essentially. Uh, but putting that formal sales system in place so you can actually sit down in a meeting, keep your mouth shut, keep your ears open a little bit more than perhaps you would like to. And the sales just come. I don't want to oversimplify it, but that's that's what happens. Scott, talk to us about the go-giver and that sort of philosophy, because you don't have a sales team, do you, within your business? No, and just oh, sorry, oh, sorry, just got to bat away all these leads that keep coming in. Um, we don't have a sales person. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, that's Brilliant. really crass. Um, but we did deck two new leads yesterday, and we don't have a sales team. Um, no, we picked up nineteen new customers last year in the last 12 months now maybe that's a lot maybe that's not a lot for me i think that was really nice we picked up at least more than one new customer every month um and we don't have a sales team um, i think to many of the points that we've got in the comments coming in I, I guess i am the sales team you know my my kind of owner player manager type role it means that i do the sales but the only way that we find leads is through our social media and marketing efforts. That's the only way that people find us. People will see a video, see a post, you know, something that we've put out there. And 
what we've tried to do in, in all of those posts is not sell. We've tried to just give value. We've tried to just help. We've tried to provide advice or guidance or insight or you know something that's happening with licensing or Windows or a technical problem. We've tried to just put that information out there and hope that it's helpful and it resonates with someone. Um, and it does. And those people see us as kind of the go-to experts. And then they just come along and go, hey, let's, you know, let's work with you guys because you clearly know this stuff better than we do. You seem like friendly people because they've seen our personality in that media that we've put across and they've come in. Um, and I just, I, I, I love that. But then, you know, the reason that we're here, I guess, on this topic today is because I look at that and go, well, 19 new customers is great. I know, I, I know what my cost of acquisition is because I've been through the training course in the, in the tech drive. I know what my CACs mm -hmm. are. Um, I know what my LTVs are for those clients. Uh, and I look at that and go, that's great. How do I do better next year? And how do I bring down cost right. of acquisition? And how do I improve lifetime value? Um, and then I go, well, is it a salesperson or is it a sales process or is it do we, you know, embed more in the digital marketing that we do? What do we double down on so that next year we do better than last year? Now, I'm, I'm looking at and again, I always like to be really candid. I'm looking at the end of this financial year. We will have doubled last year's turnover. And I'm pretty much last year's margin and profit as well. So it's, it's, it's going well. We are probably slow and steady, you know, as we grow and, and we develop and, and we, you know, we increase our turnover. So do I want to try and make an exponential leap? And is that why I should hire a salesperson? Um, or, you know, as everyone's talked about here, you know, do we just get in a, um, a sales admin or, you know, an account manager type role? Or do we do none of those things? Because actually... The giving that we're doing, and back to Richard's point about the Bob Berg, the giving that we're doing is really working and it's really paying off. And actually 19 new clients in a year is maybe amazing and I should be celebrating. But that's, that's I think, why we're here talking about this topic today is how do we get more leads and keep growing the business? And genuinely, I, I think what we're doing is working, or at least it works for us. It's give, 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 and, and, and back it comes. Um, Theo says, how many leads have you found come in from word of mouth percentage-wise? I don't know if I'm honest. I'd have to go and look. Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. We definitely have had clients who've referred other clients to us um, or they've got a partner organization or even in one case, we had someone where we got engaged with a small organization who had a relationship with a much larger one and said, hey, you know, they're trying to do the same project. Can I put you in touch with those guys? And then we had a, a huge relationship with that customer for the last two years um so we definitely have it through word of mouth but i don't know i would say mm -hmm. most of the ones that i put down when i calculated them had come through linkedin youtube right. or, or another <laughs> you know social channel right. we um we, with our word of mouth referrals we it was like a, a linear a linear a line that way sorry and that, that yeah. when i first started the business like a hundred percent of our new clients and leads came from word of mouth and then over time as you start to put other marketing strategies out there that start, the percentage starts to go down. And when we, when we probably in the last two years, when we sold the business, I'd say we were probably only at 30% of new leads or 30 or 40%. I'm going to be, that's pretty rough, but probably 30 to 40% of new leads came from referrals and the other 50, 60, 70 or whatever it was came from all our other marketing, marketing activities out there. But that was a, a nine year journey between those two things there. And it just kind of changed as we went through and dived in on some of the others. Um, Richard, you mentioned in the chat there, um, a book, another book recommendation, which I had on my shelf, which is yeah. selling technology, the Sandler way you put me onto this book. I'm pretty sure yeah, you did. Well, let's give a shout out for that book because for those of you who are watching and, you know, are intrigued by Sandler, what I said, uh, but it's like, oh, you look at it and it's like tens of thousands of pounds or whatever it costs nowadays to do it. And you're like, eek, can I just dip my toe in the water? Yes, you can. So Great the uh, the book that my beautiful assistant is showing there, Nigel, uh, <laughs> yeah, Selling Technology the Sandler Way, um, really good book if you want to get a feel for what the Sandler technique is uh, is about. But again, I'd really recommend you go and get the go-giver first. I should be on commission with Bob Berg talking about sales. <laughs> Being you, Scott, should absolutely be on commission here. We'd make a fortune. Um, it's, it's I, that I feel bad for the, the co-author because I only remember Bob Berg. And every time I pick up the book, I go, oh my goodness, there's another guy. John David Mann, yeah. And if you ever <laughs> speak to Mr. Mr. Berg about the go-giver, he'll say, thank you so much for speaking so well about the book that me and John David Mann wrote together. So he's, he's a consummate professional about that, yeah. <laughs> All right, I thought I had another book recommendation over there, but it must be on my bookshelf downstairs. 
Um, there's one, a- one thing I'd like to throw in there very briefly, because I've, I've got a few people messaging me that are actually, they're, they're sales people. They're, they're looking for a sales role in an MSP. Right. Um, so given everything we've said so far, what advice would you give to the sales people who are looking for jobs in an MSP? Um, what, what should they be looking for to find? So, because I, I know people that have been applying for jobs and they've, you know, a few have fallen through because it's not been a good fit, or the MSPs had completely, you know, polarizing expectations of what they should be doing when they come in. Um, yeah. So as the salesperson, from from their perspective, what should they look for, or maybe what questions should they ask when they're going into like interview for for these kind of roles? I can speak a little bit to this. So obviously I do a lot of work as an advisor with uh, vendors, uh, people in our space. And one of the um, things that I've done with vendor salespeople over the past few years is encourage them to build up their personal brand. Now, if this sounds a little bit woo-woo, bear with me on this one. But I can tell you that people, you know, don't really remember the organization they buy from. They remember the person they buy from. So if you are regularly doing things like LinkedIn lives and putting yourself out there and, you know, helping people, again, it's going back to this go-giver thing. I have spoken to a number of salespeople within vendors who have started off at one vendor and then been headhunted for another vendor and moving on uh, from that perspective. So they themselves are in demand. So that's not a direct answer to your question, Pete, but it's, I think if you were looking for a role within an MSP, I would very much be building my personal brand because then that's transferable. You can go anywhere and you've already built up the uh, the accumulation of um, knowledge. You've already built up the reputation that you can take and it's going to make your job as a salesperson so much easier. Yeah. One of the... Oh. One of the things that I would be doing if I was in a sales rep's shoes and I'm out there looking for a job at an MSP is I would be jumping out to interview as many MSPs as I possibly could. And I'd be going to the hunt and all the, I'd I'd kind of take the same approach that I took when I sold my MSP. And that was to find the top 300 MSPs around Australia and go and pitch them. And I'd be going in and trying to find the ones that my values aligned with, as well as the ones that had already existing mature sales processes in there. So I didn't have to come in and try and build all the stuff up myself. So I could jump in and, and have the best chance of having success pretty easily. Because um, if you're on the flip side of that whole conversation that we had before, where people are hiring sales reps and six months later, they're not getting any results. That's typically not the sales reps fault. Most of the time, it's the the business owners fault, the, 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 um, the MSPs fault for not having all the stuff around them. So as a sales rep, I'd be going and looking for businesses that are mature around that to dive into. And I'd be doing the interviewing uh, in there. And any any good business worth their weight in soul in gold will um, will be happy to be interviewed by a good sales rep out there. They'd be happy to, to answer the tough questions and to to be run over the coals with the good questions because that's when you you kind of know that you've got a good rep on your hands when they're asking those questions around that stuff. And I, I would literally go out and if I had the skills and I had the desire to go and be in the MSP space and I wanted to go and get a job in a, a fast moving one, I'd, I'd go and find a hundred or two hundred of the top MSPs in the area that I'm looking at, and I would go and. And cold pitch most of them to see if I could jump on a, a call or even if have a quick 10 minute session. I'd, I'd build a marketing, little marketing strategy around myself, like Richard said, as a little personal brand to go and get in the conversations with as many of them as I could and, and, um, and then work out through those questionings what ones align with my values and have the, the strongest and the most mature um, systems in place so I could plug in and have the best chance of success when I get in there. So I guess they should be looking for probably minimum sizes if, if we're yeah, saying there's a certain kind of size point that. There is minimum size, like it, it often cor- correlates with maturity level as the size, right? But it's not always hard and fast. But you typically, and I'm going to paint again with a stupid broad brush here, but in the thousands of MSPs that I've seen out there, like you probably don't have mature sales processes in the majority of them until you're at least at 15 to 20 staff. It's very, very rare that I see mature sales processes at a, at a level lower than that. I have. There's always exceptions to the rule, but it's typically around that size. I don't know if Richard and Pete, you see similar size into that, but that's about the size I normally see. Absolutely. Would agree with that. Well, yeah. It, you know, it becomes, we talked about a sales machine and I use the term negatively. I think um, I've seen MSPs that have got maybe three and a half million pounds mm. and above. And they have then turned into a sales machine. I also right. want to throw a point out here for anybody thinking about like, okay, we might need to, we're at that size. We might need to take a salesperson on or, or add to our sales machine. Um, the vendor relationships become super, super important when you get to that stage, because you can't get very much further without the vendor relationship. So perhaps that's another show we could talk about entirely, but vendors. there's things that happen in a certain way and in a certain order. If you try and jump that order and go, as we talked about, abdicate responsibility for sales, it all comes crashing down and it won't work. 
but vendors are also a part a piece of that puzzle as well yeah with um i've mentioned the word maturity a couple of times just in there and i want to give a little bit of context to what i mean by that um if you've been in the msp space for any long period of time you would have heard of uh, a guy called paul dipple and his service leadership um program and what that is is he paul's developed this amazing framework for all the different levels of of maturity that an MSP typically will go through out there. And he's got the, the what he calls the operational maturity level one, OML one, OML two, OML, OML three. And each of those maturity levels has, um, has parameters and characterizations that, that um, define what an MSP typically looks like in them. And you will see, you will, if, if you've never looked at it, it's, it's really interesting as an MSP owner to go and, and look into those levels and, and work out where you are on the mix and see that Paul will describe all the pain points that you might have at a certain level and all the staff members that you will typically need at a certain level in there and the ones that you won't need as well. And, and you'll see that his operational maturity levels typically start off the same, like owner-led sales all the way through up to when you're at OML5, I think is the top one where, where the owner of the business is typically just running from a chairman perspective or a shareholder perspective at that point yeah. in time and, and does have a team of sales reps and sales managers and whatever in the business. But that, that's what I mean when I'm talking about maturity is you go through as a business, you go through those layers of maturity, maturing up your, your pricing and your packaging and your service delivery and your, your sales processes and your marketing processes and yourself and your, your confidence as you, as you go through and your leadership skills and, and whatnot. It's all through that process of maturity. And every one of us is at a, at a stage on our own maturity levels as, as a business as where we are. And often it correlates with the size of your business as well, like the number of staff or the turnover or whatever. There's, there's typically a very strong correlation, but it's not always 100% um, lined up in there. There is always outliers that, like like Scott's a three or four person MSP that's probably wildly more mature than I was when I was a three person MSP out there. Um, and on the flip side, there's some 50 person MSPs that I've seen out there that are, that are ridiculously horribly immature um, and would sit at operational maturity level 0.5 out there. Uh, but the, the vast majority do fit into those characterizations pretty well in there. Um, Red Man Tech just said plus one for SLI. It is a, I, I think I came across it in like the first year of running my business. And it was such an amazing thing just to see how I fit and to just get a feel for all the pain points that I would be um, hitting and, and the different types of behaviors I should be trying to, to, to do at certain levels in there. So if you haven't seen Paul Dipple's service leadership stuff, go and, go and search for it and go and spend a couple of hours reading through it and learning all about it and, and seeing where you fit on that spectrum out there. You might um, kind of open your I eyes to, to a few One things. thing just to briefly touch on, I think, is that I'm following our, whether it was last week or the week before or what have you, about um, like hiring staff. It gets to, you get to a certain size and then you start thinking, I need to hire that salesperson um, or I need to hire that next person. It's always worth just considering that decision on what you want to be doing next as the business owner. You know, majority sure. of MSPs are like five staff or probably under 10 people, I would say, for the majority of people as, as nimble MSPs. Um, so people might instantly go out and think, I need to hire a salesman. That's fine if you really enjoy delivering the technical work and you want to carry on doing the technical yeah. work. But actually, if you want to see yourself moving away from that, maybe it makes more sense for you to do that if you enjoy it and you're good at it, then get the technical person in instead. So it's just worth having that like discussion with yourself. Um, and I guess self-realization of, are you actually any good at it as well? Because whilst you might enjoy one thing, you might not be as good as someone else you could hire to do the same thing. Correct. Um, certainly yeah. when it comes to sales, you know, I, I think most people when they uh, uh, start their MSP are probably the, the traditional techies that have gone to start their own businesses. We're all horrendous at sales. We don't know how to sell anything, um, which, which is yep. a good and bad thing. I, I always think that's actually a positive because... Whilst we don't know how to sell something, we know how to fix something. And all you know, all sales at the end of the day is we're trying to fix problems. They've got a problem in their business. We're trying to fix it by these products or services. And maybe we do go down the routes of, oh, well, these technical things will fix you and all the technical gar you know, garbage and technical terms and trying to confuse everybody. So there's a way of communicating things. But fundamentally yeah. speaking, if you get to the point where you're thinking, I'm so busy, I don't have enough time in the day, I've got enough money in the bank, I need to hire somebody have that thought of, does it need to be a salesperson? Does it need to be an engineer? Could it be an account manager instead? Mm. Could it just be a first line because they can answer the phone and just take some of the slack off from me for when I'm kind of doing the, the bits and bobs out and about and selling and whatever it is. But just have that thought with, and discussion with yourself of, A, what do you enjoy doing? And B, what are you actually good at? Because those two things might not be the same thing. If, you're, uh, if you really enjoy engineering, but actually you're not the best engineer in the world, then you need to do something about that role instead first, I would say. Uh, but That's yeah, I thought it was worth mentioning because it's it's a common thing, and I, I see it constantly in our chats that we, uh, you know, week after week is 
who do I hire first? Do I hire an engineer first? Do, do I hire an account manager? And it's, it's always different. I think every single person I speak to, everyone's got their own opinions of, oh, I want to I wanna completely get rid of the engineering stuff. I don't want to touch the technical stuff anymore. I just want to run the business. And obviously that's a much part, larger part of the business to run the business because that's everything in between. Uh, but some people want to stay technical and, and that's fine. Um, I chatted with, um, I was very fortunate to chat with the founders of 1Password, um, Dave Tier, Dave Brewster and, and the lead dev. And um, the the founders to this day are still developers. They still jump yeah. into the code base. They still yeah. make changes. And they, they hired different people. They, they hired a CEO very early on um, in their journey because the CEO is there to run the business and do the bits that they're not good at. They know that they love doing the de development work. They're really happy to do the development work. So they've, you know, they're, they're like 500 staff now and they're, they're not top docs. They're, they're just, en you know, engineers and developers. Which is um, so it's just crazy that businesses can grow that that, that fast and uh, with that that number of staff. Yeah, and you've really well, really picked the uh, job you want to do. Let's just talk about the other salespeople that we've already got within the business that we've not touched upon. We, we've sort of skirted around this, but let's be upfront and honest about it. You know, some of the best salespeople within my MSP business were the engineers. Yeah. Now again, there's going to be a conflict there between people thinking, "What salespeople, engineers?" But bear with me on this one. So we used to regularly send our engineers out, and, and I'm looking in the chat here. Um, let's have a Lee Houston says, "I think an account manager becomes critical to customer satisfaction of a certain size," and a few other people have, have, have touched upon this as well. When I ran my MSP business, we used to send engineers out to do what we called floor walks. Yeah. Uh, now this is where an engineer would go out to a site, not necessarily to fix anything. You know, they're not going there to say, oh, we've got a ticket that's open that needs doing or whatever. But they would literally go out. We would give them a little job to do. We'd say, hey, can you go and test the UPS or can you label this or do that? You know, admin type of work. Uh, and we'd say to them, like, while you're there, just wander around the floor uh, and at the client site and just tap people on the shoulder, say, hey, is everything all right? Can I help with anything? And to cut a long story short, these engineers, in, first of all, it's really good for like account management and stickiness. Uh, just that visibility of being seen on site. But secondly, those engineers would come back with a ton oh, of yeah. sales. <laughs> yep. And you know why they came back? Because they weren't going there to sell. And this is a lesson for anyone who's a technical-led business owner. They went there to help people. And people want to buy stuff, but people do not want to be sold to. Yep. <laughs> That's a really weird situation. So my engineers would go out and they'd come back. And they'd say, oh, we need a new server fitted or there's a new large form printer there or, oh, yeah, they're getting new members of staff. So we've sold three new PCs and this many licenses. So, you know, this whole thing about if we want to add sales, the single best source of sales that you can have today is upselling to your existing clients and your engineers can really help with that. Is that something that you've experienced, Nigel? Oh, absolutely. We, we um. In, when when we got to the last two years or two and a half probably years of my MSP, um, we had got our two of our senior engineers to the point where they were probably half time senior engineering, half time account managing, and and we built them up into to the, two of them up into that, that particular role, and it was it was awesome. They they took me some time to to sit and mentor them through things and take them out to different event um different meetings and whatnot so they can kind of see how the process went. But once they did, there was they were out there doing that. Like the, the customers had complete and utmost trust in them because they were out there to go and, and provide a solution, not sell something that the customer didn't Because they're not do. salespeople. Correct. Yeah. They weren't salespeople. And the customers could see that and they trusted that and they saw that. They, they loved that. And so our guys would often sell thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 deals without me being involved, which was freaking awesome. And it took some time to get to that point, but they were out there doing them like server migrations for 20 grand of labor and 40 grand worth of hardware and whatever and all sorts of stuff. Um, it didn't, it, in the early stages when I started to take them out under my wing to go and do it, um, and my business partner took one of them as well, um, it scared the crap out of me because I was like, oh, like these guys, are, like, they're, they're techs, they're, just, they're not going to be able to get it easy at all and I'm going to have this horrible, crazy process in front of me to try and train them. But I don't have the budget at the moment to hire a, a full-time account manager in the business. So either I've got to do it or I've got to get these guys to help me out with it. And um, but they surprised the crap out of me pretty early and pretty quickly. And then I got them out there and two or three deals, they were kind of running on their own and they'd come back to me and they'd put a deal together and they'd, they'd go and get the whole lot together and they'd put the proposal together for the client and they'd, they'd come and sit with me and say, oh, I'm going to go to the client. I'm going to pitch it this way and do this and do that. And I'm going, God, this is a, 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 a tech coming to me with all of this. And 
and it was awesome. And I, I think anyone out there that's got those uh, senior engineering kind of people in your business that also have a flair for wanting to just do good with clients, see if you can foster some degree of internal account manager slash internal sales repy kind of behavior in them because a lot of them might be able to shine and they and both of the people that we did ended up loving it they ended up going oh like this is what i want to do after i'm now done senior level of engineering for for years i do want to get into that kind of designing solutions for clients and helping them them close it and then they they actually had those little adrenaline rushes when they closed these deals they're going oh that was me like i'm a rep here like i'm a, a, a engineer here and i just closed this 30 or 40 or 50 grand deal um, out here, and it was kind of cool to watch it. They, they they didn't have the ego attached to it that that um that you often we, see in the. We talked about compensation as well, didn't we? And I don't want to go too deep into this subject because it could be like a whole session Whoa. of design. But we we uh, um uh, compensated is not the right word. We rewarded our engineers for making those sales deals, right. but we didn't have a reward structure for the engineers making the sales deals. Now bear with me on this one because once you put in place a reward structure and say, hey, if you bring this business back, we will give you this, whatever it might be. Your engineer stops becoming an engineer and helping people and becomes a salesperson looking to back right the yeah. reward. Does that make sense? So it's yeah. a bit of a, a conflict there. But what we did was if somebody came back, uh, you know, and they'd picked up a little bit of work or a, a nice project or whatever, we would reward them. And it was often as simple as, hey, you know, um, go out with your partner for a meal um, uh, at the poshest restaurant in town, and uh, we'll we'll comp it or we'll cover it all. It can be a, something as simple as that, or for bigger deals, it might be something like, "Hey, look, I know you didn't go in there to sell this, but we want to let you know that we appreciate you doing this, and so there's a nice bonus or something there." But it wasn't expected. Yeah, it wasn't a reward system, but we did show our appreciation there. So it's a yeah. it's a weird, you know, uh, situation. Yeah, I think if you um, go into the stage of doing a reward, you know, a, a, a process and a system and and setting standards, you, you're going to run into those issues of um, I mean, we we had like primary allocated engineers, yep. so that your engineers would be allocated clients and they would generally go yep. and see them. So then you're going to have that question of well, like. Well, my client's got more money to spend than that client, so that person is never going to get a sales deal. Why, why am I getting sales deals? Because my clients are all the small clients, and they don't have any money. And you know, yeah, it's just preempting all of those kind of uh, discussions and questions you'll get. I, I, I think um, was it Theo? Some, someone mentioned a lot earlier that they um, they had a nice way of dealing with which we did a similar way of um, taking like a percent of uh, revenue share. So you just park some money aside every single year, kind of like a like an annual bonus side of things, but you just oh, take yeah. that. Anywhere from like one to five to ten percent of your revenue, and uh, stash that in a separate bank account. So when you when you get to Christmas or you know whatever time of the year you want to do it, you can then reward your company as a whole um, for you know the, the overall effort they've done. Um, and yes, you can do performance based if you want to kind of pick and choose and um, reward those that have kind of taken that extra step. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's very difficult commission commission structures and making sure everyone feels like they're equally oh, man. Like, looked after. It's it's horrendous. We, we tried <laughs> we, it and we, failed at it many times, many times. Uh, and we ended up that's... stopping it. We just stopped. We ended up. Yeah, I just want to address something that's in the chat there. So uh, thank you for 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 the kind feedback uh, uh, from everyone. But Andrew Gordon. Uh, said by the way salespeople can be ethical too oh, 100%, yeah 100 you know uh thank you for saying that andrew because we didn't want to come across here as like bashing salespeople. now there is a stereotype isn't there in the industry if any of us think of salespeople, we think of like used car salesmen and stuff like that it's like oh that's yucky it's horrible but there is, you know, an ethical way of doing business as well. And there are a lot of really, really good people out there uh, as well. So thank you for making that point, because this isn't a salesman bashing. This is, you know, this is uh, uh, sales needs to be done in an ethical way and make sure that you build the culture to do that. I think that's another reason we looked at the um, like the account manager role rather than a salesman role. We weren't paying commission. We wanted to reward everybody because I always, I always feel that as soon as like commission gets involved, then the incentive there is to sell as much as much profit as you can do that might not be the right thing for the clients. Whereas if you're not selling on commission and actually the company as a whole benefits, then the focus there goes more on to um, you know, selling the right thing, the right products, the right solutions for each client. So that's that's why my focus has always been, and I've, I've never, you know, I've never had a company of that size where I've needed to worry about uh, commission structures, thankfully, because oh. that sounds like a horrendous mess to me. Um, <laughs> it but is. I think if I can share it, it makes yeah. it a lot simpler because it, it is. And you, well, the, the thing is, within a smaller business where you don't have that, that 
process around the products that you sell and all of that stuff and you don't have standardization around the products that you sell that's where it can get out of control because the reps go out and will sell anything but as you mature and you have a much more standardized and predefined set of things there it does make more sense then for commissions as well to start to come into play better because they're going to be incentivized to sell exactly what is needed because you're standardized across the whole lot of what what people need in there and so it does as you further go up the stack become more at play but you do have to be very careful as you say when you're just kind of leaving people loose and saying, hey, just just sell um, because incentives are out of whack and biases come into play and it's just sell whatever the heck we can, which as I think all of us have just mentioned that we've been on the receiving end as an engineer of those sorts of deals and, and had to do the all-nighters or all-weekers to to go and try and figure it out. But I think that's that's just one of those things as as you mature that that you as a business get better at, at what those those standardizations are and what, what should be sold to a client versus what could be sold to a client out there. Can we give a shout out to a couple of... Um, so I have a question. Oh, yeah, yep. go ahead, Scott. I'll save it. Yeah, go on. So um, just because you guys, it's hard to get a word in anyway sometimes. You're so passionate about this stuff. I love it. Um, but one of the questions came up in chat, which I think is a really good question. Um, I just want to touch on... Um, Theo, sorry, the answer, I looked it up whilst we were on the call. The answer was four clients out of the 19 clients that we picked up last year were through direct word of mouth, as in people that I had a personal relationship with first. The other 15 all came through social or through LinkedIn or YouTube in some other shape or form. So 21% were people that I knew, 79% were net new. Um, Richard Skellett said earlier on, a client comes to an MSP for something they want to outsource or buy outsourcing sales for an MSP, maybe for a managed sales provider. Now, we talked last week very much around outsourcing. Um, what about outsourcing sales? And I would like to say I get pitched approximately, and it's a rough guess, but two billion times a day on LinkedIn <laughs> for people who can absolutely guarantee leads for my business. And I'm like, is this the approach that you use? Because it ain't working on me. Um, and someone put up a brilliant graphic yesterday. I won't describe it. It was it was graphic graphic but it was essentially that entire process of those people who promise to get you leads and their sales approach to you you look at it and go this is crap i'm, I'm not going to buy from you what makes you think that this process will work for my clients um and so interested to know from you guys have you seen an outsourced sales process or an outsourced sales provider yeah. that works because th this is what we always say right out if, if you are special at something and the things you're not special at, get someone who's good at it to do. So mm -hmm. is there such a thing as a good managed sales provider? The, there is. I think this is the exception to that rule that we just yep. talked about. And I, like, I, there's some people I want to give a shout out in the UK, not for outsourced sales, but sales trying to hold that. But here in the UK, I've not seen people who do that outsourced sales well. And I'm, I'm open. If you're watching this and you're awesome at it, Feel free to to change my mind on it, but we could probably give you five thousand clients if you are good at it. You, you do yeah, it. but no, there are. But there's there's someone's about uh, to be inundated with LinkedIn requests. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but no, there are some in the USA. Yeah. There are some in Australia, yeah, yeah. aren't there? So perhaps uh, not that I know of in Australia. There's tons mm. of. Oh, there's not tons of, but there's a number of marketing MS like MSP specific marketing companies out there. But in terms of sales, the only one that I have heard good reports about and i actually haven't heard good reports about in the last year or two but that might just be that no one's talking about them at the moment is managed salespros.com i think it is right. um and they got acquired a couple of years ago which might be why i don't hear of them as much anymore but they used to be at all the different msp events out there and they their whole thing was just delivering you warm sales qualified leads that was it they would do all the cold calling the the, the list building the, the scrubbing the everything they would do the nurturing and just deliver you for x number of dollars per lead i think it was and and i did hear a number of good reports about them um they're the only one that i have ever seen out there and I, like you richard i would love to hear if, there, if anybody knows anybody out there doing it i reckon i've got about three thousand clients for you i'm ready to go tomorrow <laughs> My um, LinkedIn is blowing up right now. It's got to be yeah. seen with all these people getting in touch from all over the world. To, to, what I would say to Richard, I think it was Richard, wasn't it, Scott, who asked in the chat uh, about this, about outsourcing. This is the exception to the rule. So you will see us yeah. on the show talk about outsourcing companies as MSPs. Uh, you know, outsourcing stuff is not bad. 
I would say this is the exception. And what I said right at the, the top of the hour, you can't abdicate responsibility for your sales. This is not something you can just grab and say, get on and do this. You know, there's other stuff that you, you can do that admin, marketing, HR, you know, technical, all of those sort of things. Again, you're not abdicating responsibility, but they're easier to outsource. Sales, uh, perhaps not so much. I want to give a shout out, though. There's a number of uh, uh, people in the chat asking about who can I go to for help with this. So uh, Paul Lloyd here in the UK, who is a tech driver, wonderful, experienced salesman in the MSP industry. And he can help you understand how to uh, build a sales team. So he's somebody good at it. The other one is Fiona Chalice. Um, she is a, a lady who delivers sales trainings for MSPs. And she's got rave reviews. So go and check out Fiona's work as well. And the third one I'd recommend is probably uh, a US-based, and that's Jennifer Bleem. Um, yes. And on more of a cybersecurity focus. So Jennifer, she's done a lot of work with us in the tribe, hasn't she, Nigel? Yeah. And she's awesome yeah, yeah. at what she does. Yeah, go on. She's about to release a book in the coming month on selling cybersecurity out there. And it's an amazing book that runs through the whole framework. It's going to be a, a, a definite read for any MSP out there. But I'll put in a plus one for Fiona and Paul as well. Two awesome people that um, that know the MSP space and the B2B uh, solution selling space like crazy. Uh, they're both in the UK, but I believe both of them also work with clients over in the US from time to time as well. And they probably, that means they, they work with people in Australia as well. I don't think they're 100% yeah. um, stuck. If you are a tech driver as well, and we've already had a number of people comment in the chat, we did, if I say so myself, an awesome session <laughs> with Paul Lloyd on the uh, sales system. Yes. So you can go and check that out. And if you're looking for uh, more information on Jennifer or uh, Fiona, I've done uh, Tub Talk podcast interviews with them as well. So if you're worried about oh, getting in touch with a salesperson and being sold to, you can go and check them out from a distance. Yep. I think it's time to wrap up. Rather than going over, we can we can wrap up with 60 seconds to go. Um, hopefully that's been helpful for everyone. It's sales is one of those those kind of hotly debated topics out there. Um, as I think it was, was it, who was it? Um, Andrew said, like salespeople can be ethical too. A thousand percent. We don't want to make this a bashing on sales people out there in any way, shape or form. Um, sales people doing the right thing with the, the right intentions and selling the right products are some of the most important people in the world out there because um, otherwise people wouldn't wouldn't get what they need, right? We wouldn't get what yeah. we need out there. So so I'm all for um, sales in the right positions with the right ethical intentions behind them. I think it's, it's a wildly important and needed thing. Often that's the MSP owner. You certainly get to a point where it's not and you, you can bring in a team. But um, it's, as I think the, the overarching thing from this is that's typically a later in your journey thing rather than earlier in your journey thing that you, you're going to bring in a sales rep in there. Um, thanks, uh, Aaron says. Great work, gents. Awesome content as always. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, thanks, Aaron. Leo. Thanks, everybody else in the comments. The comments, we always love seeing them fly past and try to keep up with them all. Um, so thank you. Um, Richard says, I'm done. <laughs> I just, <laughs> we've got a little own internal chat that we've got going on. And his thing is, I'm done. Yeah, I'm stick done. a pin in me, I'm cooked. Um, so time to wrap up. Um, Pete, you're our, you're our wrap up artist. You can sweet. Of course. Yeah. Thanks very much for watching yeah. again. Thanks for the comments. And, uh, if you are watching this on the replays after, and you're watching on like YouTube platforms, leave your questions or comments or anything down below. We'll still respond to those. I think, uh, in between them when That's we right. can do, um, subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. YouTube.com slash tech tribe. Make sure you're subscribed or followed or whatever it is on all your podcast platforms. Um, just just briefly in the tech tribe, is are there sales resources and um, sales training? Is there any sales training courses um, you've got there? There is a cybersecurity sales workshop in there that we've got in there. We, we um, commissioned Jennifer Bleem to go and do it. It's a, probably a seven-part workshop with tons of objection handling worksheets and stuff like that in there. Um, there is also, a, I think it's a 74-slide sales deck built for MSPs that you can go and like, you're not going to use all 74 slides. You're going to cut out bits and pieces that you don't need, but it's, it leads people through a journey of, of selling managed services in there. So there's that. Um, and there's a, there's a bunch of other little bits and pieces here and there that you can, you can find in there. There are two of the main things in there that will help. Sweet. Right. But yeah, that's Rick, it. What about yours, Pete? Um, have you got some sales stuff inside in not a business coach? Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say specifically sales stuff. Like the supporting um, material around the outside of it is more. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's more just yeah, delivering the service and marketing approaches and those kind of things. Because, yeah, we, we didn't, didn't get to the size where we needed that kind of sales role, so to speak. Um, yeah. More around the quoting process and the follow-up and, and that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, there's, there's a little bit stuff. in there. Okay, all the important stuff. Um, <laughs> cool. 
Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, gents. Thank you, guys and gals, from the, the the audience for listening and and chiming in on the chat. We will come up with some sort of topic topic for same time, same place next week. The way we'll do it is we're going to ask Scott in a minute what his next challenge is. <laughs> see if we can find out. Um, so we will figure that out. We'll post it and the thing. But as Pete said, go and make sure you go and click the subscribe button, and we'll see you same time, same place next week. Bye for now.